Frederick Bastiat said, when law and morality contradict one another, the citizen has the cruel alternative of either losing his sense of morality or losing his respect for the law. We Americans are increasingly encountering Bastiat's cruel alternative. And let me spend just a few moments examining this phenomenon. Traditionally, the common law assumption was that if one behaved morally and used common sense, the reasonable person doctrine, some of his actions could possibly lead to civil penalties for accidents and mistakes, but not to criminal penalties. With the growth of the Leviathan state in our country, that has all changed. Under what lawyer James D. DeLong calls the new criminalization in our country, with its increased complexity and arbitrary provisions, no one, no American can rely on his moral compass or common sense to steer him clear of criminal prosecution. For example, let me give you a few examples. An engineer in Maryland was contracted to do work on private property. He was imprisoned for polluting the navigable waters of the United States by merely dumping two truckloads of soil on dry land. A rancher was criminally prosecuted for clearing brush from old irrigation ditches. Another man was brought, <coughs> brought to before a grand jury for stabbing a falcon, falcon, whatever you want to call him, with a pitchfork that was killing one of his chickens. Another man was charged for shooting a bear in self-defense. In Newark, New Jersey, 500 people have been fined for putting aluminum cans in their trash. These and possibly thousands of other examples damage the societal sense of morality. That is, people who see themselves as responsible, law-abiding people begin to develop a contempt for the law. And when we lump what's trivial with what's barbaric as criminal activities, as we are increasingly doing in our country, it undermines our sense of moral priorities, as in the case of Newark, where 500 people have been fined for deliberately or inadvertently putting beer cans in their trash. That kind of says to people, well, it's more important to prosecute people for these kinds of activities than to prosecute all the thieves, murderers, and rapists in Newark, New Jersey. The growth of the Leviathan state is undermining our moral priorities, I believe. Deficits and debt are another example of our declining morality in our country. Now, we all know that we have federal deficits exceeding $300 billion a year. I know at the Clinton administration, they give another number, but if you uh, take away all the games, you're talking about $300 billion or more a year. 
And we have a national debt that's approaching $5 trillion. And matter of fact, that uh, $5 trillion national debt is understated because if we include all federal obligations, such as Social Security, government retirement, guaranteed loans, et cetera, et cetera, we'd be talking about something closer to $16 trillion. Now, this is something unprecedented in our history. For the most part, the only time in our history when we ran deficits was during war times. In 1787, federal spending was about $3 million a year, or about $1 per citizen. By 1910, the federal government spent a little more than $600 million a year, about $6.75 per person. By 1929, the federal government spent $3 billion a year, and they, they went up to $29 per person. Today, the federal government spends over $4 billion per day, and that comes to $6,000 per person, and controlling for inflation, that represents a 9,000% increase in federal spending between 1929 and today. Now, the, our founding fathers, who were paying about 67 cents a year in taxes, they went to war with Great Britain, <laughs> claiming that taxation without representation is tyranny. Now, that reminds me of a conversation I was having in Cambridge, uh, London, with uh, Lord Harris of the High Cross and Peter Bauer and several other people. And uh, Lord Harris of High Cross, he asked me, uh, Williams, he said, where do you live? And you know, I tend to be flippant sometimes. <laughs> and so I said, I live in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. That's where the British ran George Washington, but we came out when the winter was over and kicked your butts out of the country. <laughs> and so he said, yeah, you went to war with us for taxation without representation. He said, how do you feel about it with representation? <laughs> So, uh, so I owe Lord Harris of High Cross a gotcha. <laughs> now, our profligate spending is an example of moral, is another example of moral decline. Because we've lost fiscal discipline and regard for future generations. After all, we might ask, what is the moral basis for imposing massive obligations on future generations in the name of bread and circuses. But the tragedy of it all is that there's little indication or incentive to reverse that trend. In 33 years, we've had one balanced budget in our country, but Congress tries. Going back to 1974, we remember that Congress passed the Budget Control Act. You might ask, is the budget in control? In 1979, Congress passed the Balanced Budget Act, making balanced budgets the law of the land. Now, of course, you remember the 1984 tax increases that were widely publicized as, and sold to Americans as a down payment on the deficit. In 1985, we had the Graham Rudman Hollings Emergency Deficit Reduction Act, which mandated a balanced budget by the end of 1992. Then we had the 1990 budget deal that was supposed to bring, cut the budget, the uh, deficit in half. And of course, uh, last year we had the budget deal, which was the largest tax increase in our history, and again, sold to Americans as a uh, as a deficit fighter. Now, there's, I think one of the things we have to recognize is that there's little private incentive among all of us to downsize government spending. And this can be seen when we consider, when we ask ourselves the question, what are the prospects of a person winning political office, either as a representative or as a senator or as a president, who campaigned 
to strictly uphold the United States Constitution, both its letter and spirit, and refuse to call for or participate in activities whereby the government confiscates what right, rightfully belongs to one American and give it to another American to whom it does not belong. Such a person campaigning on that kind of promise would never win office. That is, if I'm campaigning, if I'm running for the senator from Virginia, and I say, <laughs> Uh, I will not uh, support, I will not bring back Virginians uh, meals on wheels, aid to higher education, highway construction funds. I would never win office. And if such a candidate were actually elected, he would have neither respect nor credibility, and his constituents would probably run him out of office. And the tragedy of all this, the supreme tragedy of all this, is that his constituents would be absolutely right from an economic point of view. That is, and the reason is very simple, that is, if a senator does not bring home goodies for his constituents, it doesn't mean that his constituents' taxes will be lowered. All that it means is that instead of Virginia citizens getting the goodies, Iowa citizens get the goodies. In other words, he'd be asking his constituents to commit Harry Carey. And I don't believe that that's a very successful political argument. We have in our country what some scholars call the tragedy of the commons, whereby it pays for everybody to use government in attempt to steal from everybody else in our country.